Hello, and thank you very much uh, for coming to this talk today. Um, if you are watching this as a recording, then unfortunately, I'm unable to be with you today. However, uh, again, uh, thank you for coming to my talk today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about rolling out the red carpet for production Kubernetes clusters with a cube VIP. Um, my name is Daniel Finneran, uh, also known as the BSD box on GitHub and, and Twitter and other places. Uh, and I'm currently leading the engineering efforts in developer relations at Equinix Metal. So to kick things off, um, a bit of background, I guess, into the, the Cube VIP uh, project. Um, many, many roles ago, I was uh, predominantly focused on helping customers and end users roll out uh, bare metal Kubernetes um, servers and, and clusters. Um, and from that, I, I kind of spawned a, a bare metal provisioning project in order to kind of alleviate a lot of the issues that I was finding getting these, these uh, clusters rolled out. So it was quite a simple project to automate the deployment of bare metal servers. It would typically stand up the operating system. And then uh, once I kind of got that automated, it later kind of developed into a provisioning engine um, to not only stand up the operating system, but then to stand up the Kubernetes clusters that, that sat on top of it. Um, I then started to kind of take it, I guess, to the next level by looking at building a, a CAPI, so a cluster API provider to automate um, the entire end-to-end -end platform. And this is typically where I, I started to hit a number of problems, mainly around kind of the, the life cycle and, and turning these clusters into something that was a, a bit more kind of production ready. So um, the, you know, the kind of typical architecture of, of Kubernetes clusters are that we have a control plane, uh, which should be made up of more than one uh, control plane node, and then typically as many workers as required in order to run applications and workloads and things like that. Um, the high available and the production kind of side of things typically mean that um, we need to really kind of protect the control plane because without the control plane, we no longer have access to do anything with that Kubernetes cluster. Um, your workloads more than likely will continue to carry on running. However, we can no longer change things. We can no longer get the state of everything that's actually running within that Kubernetes cluster. So we need to look at making the control plane highly available. So typically in order for a highly available Kubernetes cluster, we obviously need more than one control plane node, um, but we also need a number of other kind of components in order to provide highly available uh, access and redundancy in, in, in the case of um, in the case of failure. Um, previously or in a lot of examples, um, you will find people having additional nodes that sit in front of their Kubernetes clusters that provide things like uh, load balancing or highly available uh, IP addresses. So we we need to add additional capacity to kind of cater for that. And then they will effectively provide access then to the control plane nodes that sit beneath them. So what's kind of the, the bill of materials um, that, that, that are required in order to provide that highly available uh, access? So if we kind of drill down into um, one of these nodes that sits before our Kubernetes cluster uh, and look kind of under the covers, we typically need uh, a clustering technology that will um, ensure that one of these front-facing nodes is elected the leader. Um, and in the event of that leadership changing, it needs to be able to uh, reflect that change to the network so that traffic can go to whichever node has now been elected to that leader. And then uh, the capability to perhaps load balance to uh, the control plane nodes that sit, that sit beneath it. So, um, you know, if we kind of look at all this, and these are kind of the issues that I was facing, this incurs kind of a lot of operational overhead. Um, from an automation perspective, there are a lot of additional pieces of software that are required to provide that functionality. We need to automate the load balancing part of things. We need to load balance, uh, we need to automate the clustering technology and, and the, the tooling that we use to provide uh, virtual IP addresses and things like that. This requires you know, kind of all the operational knowledge of that tooling in order to design and implement that into uh, the infrastructure. But from a cluster lifecycle perspective, each of these specific bits of tooling have their own configuration, their own lifecycle. Um, all of that makes it kind of quite hard to automate. So that's kind of where the project kind of spawned from. Um, and then, you know, kind of, I realized that we could kind of take it a little bit further. So um, we have our Kubernetes cluster up and running, um, but, you know, 
pods uh, inside a Kubernetes cluster typically can't be accessed from outside the cluster. Um, and prior, we would need additional technologies in order to expose these to uh, outside worlds, out the outside world. So uh, a service of type load balancer is typically used in order to expose uh, a collection of pods to the outside world through an external IP address. So I kind of realized that, um, you know, I kind of already implemented a lot of the technology in order to do that. And that is where KubeVip went from not only providing just highly available um, Kubernetes clusters, so production ready Kubernetes clusters, but also being able to provide load balancer functionality to allow external access to pods inside your Kubernetes cluster. So uh, this is kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so KubeVip backgrounds, I've already done that. Um, but we're going to be looking at kind of the architecture of KubeVip and the protocols that it uses in order to uh, expose uh, things to the outside world. We'll look at how the highly available Kubernetes clusters actually look like with KubeVip. We'll discuss kind of the load balancer services, what that looks like and how that works. Um, a little bit of the roadmap in terms of things that we're working on next, and then um, hopefully time for some questions. So um, in the initial uh, design, um, KubeVip was designed to sit outside of the, the Kubernetes cluster. And in order for it to work, we needed um, a way of having a leadership election. So we originally opted for using Raft, which already runs inside Kubernetes through uh, etcd. Um, Raft requires uh, an odd number of members in order for the election process to actually work. Um, and Raft effectively works by having uh, elections on a regular basis. Um, and if um, one of the nodes becomes ill or doesn't respond in time, et cetera, then there will be a new leadership uh, election. And one of the other nodes then will get, will become the leader in the cluster. Um, unfortunately, this worked in order of standing, standing up Kubernetes clusters, the node would become leader and, and, and do all of the highly available side of things. However, unfortunately, um, things like upgrades and, and, and in some cases, node failures, we would typically end up in a position where Raft was unable to elect a leader. Um, and without there being a leader, there was no longer um, a, a running cluster. So we decided to look at alternative ways of having leader elections. Um, it turned out that um, there was a, an easy way of doing this. Uh, Kubernetes, the Kubernetes API, um, actually provides a, a functionality called leader election. So um, we can effectively make use of that in order to provide our leader election. So um, using you know, kind of things like the, the Kubernetes uh, Go SDK, um, we can effectively have some code that will connect to the API and say that it wants to, it wants to participate in this leader election. So typically kubevip has this code within it. Um, and a number of kind of kubevip instances will connect to the Kubernetes API and say, uh, I want to hold this lease. I want to be, um, uh, uh, you know, I want to be the leader. Um, the Kubernetes API will then make the decision um, and say, you can hold the lease, at which point, whichever instance of the code holds the lease now is the leader uh, within that election. And typically, um, a node can relinquish that lease when it shuts down, or if it, uh, if it becomes unresponsive, then uh, a timeout will occur and the process will restart where all of the other nodes that participate in that leader election will also ask for the lease and one of the other one nodes um, will then get that lease. So this allows uh, us to have that technology of um, A, having um, one of the participants become the leader. And then in the event of failure or upgrades or, or anything uh, lifecycle related, um, if something times out or fails, one of the other nodes can, can have that leader election and become the leader within that cluster. Um, so when a new node becomes a leader for the first time, um, it will need to inform the network, uh, the wider network, um, that traffic should come to it. Uh, there are two distinguish there are two technologies that we focus uh, that we rely on within KubeVip. Um, the first one is ARP, which is a layer two uh, protocol, and effectively um, ARP allows a node on the network to effectively um, broadcast and update that network so that that network knows to send traffic to it when it is wanting to send traffic to a particular IP address. So uh, in this kind of quick example on the left, we have uh, two nodes. Um, 
and um, when one node comes up for the first time and it wants to tell the network that its IP address is linked to this particular uh, MAC address. So a MAC address is a uh, hardware address that's built into the network card. Um, it can broadcast to the network that to get to this IP address, send your layer two traffic to this MAC address. So it effectively uh, updates the network um, to say, IP address to this MAC address. And that effectively is how layer two traffic actually works. When we want to send traffic to an IP address, we look up on an internal table, where which piece of hardware do we want to actually send the traffic to? Um, and in the event that we have a leader election, we then do that layer two update. So we know, so the network knows where traffic should actually go. Uh, BGP is a layer three protocol. So effectively, um, what that means is that devices can publish uh, routes to uh, a, a networking device so that when traffic is routed through them, uh, they hold the knowledge of where that traffic should go as a, as a next hop. So um, in this example, we have, uh, we have a number of servers that are all running. Um, we have a top of rack uh, router, and then we have a client device, which in this case is a laptop. Um, all of the devices that, that want to share these routes will need to participate um, in, in what's called peering. So they will need to connect to that router um, and advertise that in order to get to a particular address or range, then traffic should be routed to them. So in, in this example, uh, we can see the second server here, the dot 21 server. Um, it also has additional IP addresses. So uh, it, it has the IP address 10.0.2.5. And it is peering and advertising to the router um, that all traffic that needs to get to that 10 address should be sent to the 192.21 address. So what that allows the router to do is know which node to send traffic to in order to get to that additional, to that next step IP address. So when the client wants to get to 10.0.2.5, it connects through that router, which could be its default gateway. Um, the router then knows to send traffic to that .21 host, which will then allow the traffic to get to that, that .2.5 address. Um, one additional benefit of BGP is that uh, it typically offers load balancing out of the box via the router. So we can see we have multiple nodes uh, all advertising that 10.0.2.5 address to the router. And then a client that goes to that address um, will be sent to one of those nodes um, that is participating in, in that peering. So kind of a, a quick overview in terms of kind of the pros and cons uh, between the two. Um, ARP is a standard um, a protocol that's existed in network equipment um, for many years. It doesn't require anything uh, special. Uh, BGP, however, does require uh, layer three routing. So either a top of rack switch or a router um, that supports that is actually required. Um, and some hardware vendors may require additional licenses in order for it to work. Um, ARP poisoning um, can disrupt a network. So ARP poisoning is where a malicious actor on the network starts advertising false IP addresses to false MAC addresses. And effectively what that would allow a, a user to do is to kind of black hole traffic. So for instance, um, I could tell everybody that in order to get to um, a particular IP address, they need to go to a fake MAC address, at which point people will start to see traffic failing because their ARP tables have been poisoned. Uh, however, BGP can mandate authentication um, and you can have ACLs and rules on the routers, which would stop malicious routes being advertised. Um, ARP, um, some switches in virtual software um, and, and physical switches actually can restrict uh, ARP, broad, ARP updates. Um, so for instance, if things are changing too rapidly, some switches will start denying um, those broadcasts from hitting going, going further on the network. Uh, BGP, because it's layer three, requires uh, firewall access, um, possibly on a, on a UDP port to, to the router. Um, ARP is fantastic for small networks, doesn't require expensive or uh, clever hardware. So it's, it's really good for edge uh, and smallish network segments. Whereas BGP, uh, you know, ultimately kind of powers the internet. Um, so 
uh, we can kind of see how well BGP scales. So, you know, we've kind of discussed uh, the clustering technologies that power KubeVip. Um, we've discussed the networking protocols that we use to update the network and allow access into, into KubeVip. Um, we're going to discuss how you actually get KubeVip actually deployed. So, um, using leader election as part of the cluster, as part of the uh, Kubernetes API, means that we actually run KubeVip inside of Kubernetes now. So, uh, Raft has largely been deprecated because it was deemed kind of unstable. Now we run Kubernetes as a pod uh, inside of Kubernetes, which connects up to the API server, participates in leader election, et cetera. So two common methods, either a static pod uh, or a daemon set. And both of those methods uh, both come with their own unique quirks to a certain degree. So um, static pods. Um, originally with KubeVip, I was using KubeADM. Well, I still am using KubeADM. Um, but that effectively would come with a chicken and egg scenario in that uh, KubeADM in it has a check which tries to connect to the virtual IP, this floating IP address, um, as part of the installation procedure. Now, what that means is that KubeVip needs to be stood up and advertising this, this virtual IP address before the KubeADM in it fails. However, um, you know, how can I deploy a pod to a cluster before the cluster's installed? Um, and this is where kind of the static pod mechanism kind of came in. So what we can do is we can kind of simulate the, the behavior of kubeadm in it, in that kubeadm in it will effectively populate a, a number of manifests in the, the Kubernetes manifests folder. Um, and then kubelet is effectively told to start up by kubeadm in it. And then kubeadm in it will start all of those static pods that are those manifests in the manifests folder. What we can do is we can add our own static manifest for kubevip inside the manifests folder um, before we do the kubeadm in it. And this basically allows kubeadm in it to sit alongside all of the control plane components and kubevip will just start up alongside of all of those. So the API server will start, the schedule will start, etcd will start and kubevip will also start at the same time, which means it can connect to the API server and it can expose that control plane IP address to the outside world. Uh, with a daemon set, that's much simpler. Um, in this example, we're using uh, K3S from Rancher. Um, and with this, we've effectively uh, given an additional piece of, of information, which is the TLS SAN line, which um, effectively means that uh, K3S will add an additional control plane IP address to our uh, certificates for the API server. Um, so we can stand that cluster up. And then once the, the cluster is actually up and running, we can do a kubectl apply of the kubevip manifest as a daemon set, bring up those additional uh, control plane nodes, and it will just scale across. It will come up and it will start advertising that 10.0.2.5 address as a uh, as a hate highly available virtual IP address. So it really depends on you know kind of a um, the Kubernetes distro um, that you're deploying or the installation mechanism that you're actually um, looking at going down. Um, some of the cluster API providers that are using KubeVip today uh, typically rely on KubeADM as part of the bootstrap bootstrap process. So um, they typically will deploy that manifest inside the manifests folder uh, as part of the, the cluster API provider functionality. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, with some of the, the technologies mentioned, we now have all of the components required to provide uh, high availability. We have that clustering algorithm um, that will ensure that in, the, in uh, node failure and upgrade, another node will take leadership and continue to receive traffic. And the networking topologies will be updated should there be any changes. So what does it all actually look like? Um, in this example, we have our three control plane nodes. We no longer require additional nodes that sit atop to provide um, high availability and things like that. So we've already reduced um, the amount of nodes that are actually required to provide that high availability. So we can see we have our three nodes uh, as part of the control plane. They're all running the control plane components. They all have uh, static pod manifests, which means that KubeVip is actually running on them. And we can also see the first node has been elected leader, which means that it carries the virtual IP address. 
So in the event that node number one is um, removed or is part of the upgrade procedure, the kubevit pod will uh, be terminated, at which point uh, one of the other nodes at the part of the, the, the cluster will do that leader election. They will um, ultimately be given the lease. Once they have been given that lease, they will start advertising that to, to get to the control plane, um, I have the VIP and send traffic to me. So um, from an end user perspective, um, you may see one or two ping loss during the, the failover, um, but it is very quick. In some cases, almost instantaneous. Um, the leader election happens as soon as the other node is, is removed um, and the ARP broadcasts will ultimately uh, update the network immediately. From a BGP perspective, um, either a daemon set or we have uh, static pods here, um, all three of them carry the VIP, um, but they carry it on a internal adapter. So what that means is that that 10.0.2.5 address isn't directly uh, accessible by the outside world. Otherwise, we would end up in a position of conflicting IP addresses. So that's something to, to be aware of, but it's not something that, that would trouble you due to the architecture of this. And effectively, um, what that means is that uh, an, a client that wants to connect to the Kubernetes control plane, that wants to get to 10.0.2.5, will connect uh, through the router. Um, and that router will ultimately send traffic to one of any of the nodes that is peering. So we get load balancing from that router automatically. In the event that one of the nodes dies, so we can see here number node, uh, node one has become unaccessible. That node will uh, stop uh, advertising. It will stop being part of the peering for those, uh, those routes to that IP address at which point the router will no longer be able or will no longer have that route and will no longer send traffic to that node. So uh, as soon as that node disappears um, from being able to peer, traffic will no longer be sent to that node. So this provides instantaneous failover in the event of upgrades or failure and things like that. So uh, we've kind of covered, um, you know, kind of the highly available part of, of KubeVip, how it, how it typically works. Typically it sits um, alongside the control plane components, uh, participates in leader elections and advertises a control plane IP address to the outside world and updates in the event of failure and things like that. Um, taking it to the next step was effectively, you know, using those same technologies for uh, Kubernetes services. So um, there are two components that are typically required in order to provide the, the functionality. One is a CCM which is a cloud controller manager. And then the second is something to provide uh, that networking magic. So uh, in this example, um, KubeVip. So what is a cloud controller? Well, a cloud controller is effectively the secret source. Um, when you want to run a Kubernetes cluster on your own or other people's infrastructure. So in most cloud providers, it provides effectively that translation layer between um, Kubernetes objects and the infrastructure um, where it's actually running. What does that kind of mean? Um, it means that when I want to do something uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, the CCM can kind of translate that into the infrastructure of where it's running. So for instance, on places like AWS or Google Cloud and uh, other cloud providers, um, the cloud controller will allow us to speak directly to the infrastructure of AWS. So if I require an external IP address and EIP and things like that, that cloud controller can speak to the AWS or cloud providers APIs and get that bit of information for us that's specific to that infrastructure. So a CCM for your infrastructure um, is slightly different. Um, everybody, especially on-prem has um, different uh, topologies, uh, different network ranges, different architectures and things like that. So your own CCM needs to be very flexible for a large number of different infrastructures. Um, it needs to be configurable for different networks and network ranges. Um, and ideally, uh, you know, kind of capable of plugging into things like existing IPAM or other infrastructure management tooling. So there is work that's taking place at the moment on the cluster API project um, in order of having an IPAM controller which typically would allow you to you know, give it the knowledge of your network uh, ranges, and it will provide uh, IPAM functionality. 
So um, a CCM, how does it, what does it do from a Kubernetes services perspective? So um, I'm doing kubectl expose of Nginx um, and we're, we're creating a load balancer service. So if we look at what has been created here, uh, we can do a, a get service and, and kind of describe it. We can see here um, that we have a service, but it has not been given a load balancer IP address. So as I was saying with an EIP uh, from AWS, for instance, um, the CCM's role is effectively to be able to link the two together. So, you know, kind of what, what, what happens here? So we have kubevip deployed um, on our workers. Um, in this example, uh, we could have it deployed as a daemon set or as a replica set um, tied to a specific set of nodes, for instance. Um, so we have done that expose. Um, we have a CCM running, so kubevip has its own CCM. However, um, kubevip is designed in a way that doesn't tie it to any particular CCM. Uh, and I'll kind of show why in a second. But this allows uh, end users to create their own CCMs. Um, and a number of people have done that. So Har Harvester has its own CCM that Kubevip will work with. Equinix Metal has a CCM um, that Kubevip will work with. And Kubevip has its own CCM. Uh, and as mentioned, um, the CCM's role um, really is that link between the infrastructure. Uh, and when we're talking about load balancer services, here, its role really is to just update the spec and give it that load balancer IP address. So how does kubevip actually work with that? kubevip has what's known as a watch, um, a watcher inside it, which is code that speaks to the Kubernetes API and, and, and can watch for changes of Kubernetes objects. When the CCM updates that load balancer IP address with an IP address um, for the network, uh, kubevip will see that the IP address has been added to the service, and it will then use those technologies to advertise that to the outside world, so either through ARP or BGP. That means that any traffic now to that load balancer IP address will be sent to the kubevip pod, which will then hit the services network and be sent to the pods that are part of that service. Um, so additionally, um, kubevip was then kind of updated to work in a hybrid mode, and this is mainly for kind of edge uh, deployments. This allows um, kubevip to do both HA and services through the control plane. So um, they will all participate in that leader election for, for the highly available VIP. So uh, traffic will go to the kubevip uh, pods um, when trying to hit the control plane, but also uh, also, when traffic is coming into a Kubernetes service, um, that traffic will hit uh, those pods and be pushed onto the services network, where traffic will be then sent to those pods. So effectively, this allows us to not only do HA, but Kubernetes services um, on the control plane for kind of hybrid and small deployments. Um, one additional feature um, that we added was uh, DHCP load balancers. Again, this is kind of useful for um, edge deployments. Um, so effectively what this allows us to do, and we can see in the example there, we've specified a load balancer IP address of 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0, which is a valid invalid IP address. Um, but what that effectively means is that the Kubernetes API will accept it as an IP address for a service. Um, and what actually happens here is when we specify a, a service with that IP address, the kubevip pod will actually do a DHCP request to the network where it will be given a, an IP address from a DHCP server on that network. Uh, in this example, we have you know, like a home router um, that typically provides DHCP inside, inside your house uh, or inside a, an office and things like that. Um, it has given kubevip an IP address of .1.123. kubevip now will update the service with the IP address and then use that to expose uh, the service to the outside world. So we effectively get uh, free topology information from uh, the DHCP server. Um, and this works great in small networks where uh, edge environments where we can leave all of the IPAM knowledge to whatever it is that's providing DHCP functionality inside that network. So that's some of the additional functionality around kubevip. So we've covered 
a bit of the backstory. We've covered how high, avail high availability works. We've covered how CCMs work and how QBIP can use that information then to expose access into the services network for services of type load balancer. So that's kind of where QBIP is at the moment. Um, from a, a roadmap perspective, um, a few months ago, we submitted QBIP to the CNCF sandbox. It has now been accepted as a sandbox uh, project, which is fantastic. And I'm very proud of that. Um, from a new features perspective, we're looking at uh, improved control plane load balancing. So at the moment, um, control plane load balancing is actually uh, not enabled by default. Um, we're looking at either using IPVS or the Maglev project in order to load balance across nodes that are control plane nodes. Um, ARP doesn't provide load balancing um, across multiple nodes. So effectively, what that means is that what, whatever node is the leader receives all traffic. So we're looking at methods in order to distribute uh, ARP load balancers, um, and there's work that's actually happened there. Enhancements to BGP. Um, we've already started work on observability, uh, observability uh, and monitoring. Uh, OSPF is an option for routing traffic. Uh, external DNS updates for services. So work has already begun here where um, we can do a kubectl expose. And KubeVip can then uh, update um, external DNS providers with both the VIP and uh, service name, dot subdomain, et cetera. Uh, we've already done proof of concepts for Bind and Cloudflare. Uh, and then additional improvements around IPv4 and IPv6. And then uh, a lot of work around documentation updates. So uh, all of the documentation is at kubevip.io. Um, Everything uh, for code is all in the QVIP repositories. With that, thank you very much. Um, and if you are using QVIP, I hope you enjoy it and it is doing um, what it is meant to be doing for you. If not, um, please raise issues and let me know. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy load balancing with QVIP. Thank you.